Uh, our symposium continues at full speed. Uh, I'm Yitya Hiaikizar from the Ankara University School of Medicine, and I'm the Scientific Committee President of Ankara University Neuroscience Committee. Our next presentation's topic is magnetic resonance and guided focused ultrasound ablations in neurological practice from our precious speaker, Dr. Jan Sarıca from the University of Toronto School of Medicine. We thank him dearly for being here with us today. And before starting, we would like to remind our dear participants that at the beginning of the pre presentation, our session attendance form will be open for answers, and at the end of the presentation, our form will be closed. Then we will move on to the question and answer part of the session. Lastly, uh, now with, the, with your permission, uh, I'm going to turn off my camera and leave the floor to Dr. Jan Sarıca. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizing and... committee for organizing such a nice symposium and inviting me. Uh, let me share my presentation. Okay. Today, I'm going to mention on, about the current state of focus ultrasound applications in the brain. So, as uh, he had mentioned, I'm working in Toronto Western Hospital together with Dr. Yamamoto and Dr. Zemar was working with us last year. Now he is in the field. So. so I will start uh, with the historical background of focus ultrasound applications. So as you can see on the right bottom side of the screen, this is the first focus ultrasound machine that is uh, designed to use in animal experiments. Uh, it is invented by the uh, Dr. Lean in 1940s, and uh, they sonicated some animals with this machine. Uh, the machine is quite huge compared to the uh, current machines, and it is the prototype of the focus ultrasound machines in the world for biological use. So during that time in 1940s, 50s, uh, there was a problem during the human brain applications. The problem is that the skull bone and the hair strongly attenuate, reflect, and distort ultrasound, and resulting in inefficient delivery and off-target effects. So this was the biggest problem on that time. So uh, in this animal study by Dr. Fry, uh, they are using a cat uh, for uh, experiment and they uh, solve this problem by doing a craniectomy, which means that removing of the skull and applying the acoustic waves through through brain uh, without a barrier of skull. Uh, these experiments uh, were followed by human experiments. So uh, successful after successful animal experiments, uh, the team started working on real human patients. This is a Parkinson's patient, and uh, they did a substantial negro ablation with focus ultrasound in this patient. So they again removed the bone, uh, put the skin flap back, back, and then they, they sonicate the patient and create uh, a lesion in the substantia nigra of this patient. Uh, after the procedure, they put the bone back and uh, it is the, I think the, these are the first patients that are treated with focus ultrasound uh, for brain uh, diseases. So the, on that time, at that time, the treatment is so novel and it was on the cover of even the uh, magazine. So as you can see, they uh, printed uh, the patient's photograph on the cover of the uh, Science and Mechanics Journal here. So in 60s, uh, people started doing lobotomies, uh, ablations in the uh, different regions of the brain with using the same technology. Uh, so, so the problem that the uh, uh, craniectomy needs has been solved uh, in 90s actually, and the first treatment of transcranial focus ultrasound application which means that we are not removing the bone. It was performed in 2009. Uh, it was a tele telemotomy procedure for chronic pain. 
So Dr. Yamamoto mentioned about the technology to overcome this problem in his uh, presentation. So I will not go in details in the uh, technology. So the technology to overcome this uh, problems is the real-time MRI, MRI thermometry monitoring and phase array transducers. So how the focus ultrasound acts. So the mechanism of action is depends on two principles, actually. The first principle is the temperature change. So focus ultrasound increasing the temperature in a single point. And the other principle of action is the cavitation. Cavitation is the oscillation of bubbles in response to pressure waves. So as you can see here, uh, we are focusing the uh, acoustic beams on a single target and we are increasing the temperature uh, in this target. So the, once we reach the 56 centigrade uh, decrease, Celsius decrease, uh, the tissue become uh, necrotic and uh, we are uh, stopping the pathological oscillations in the circuit by doing an ablation with the focus ultrasound. So cavitation, there are two different kinds of cavitations. So uh, in stable cavitation, bubbles oscillate without collapse, but can cause mechanical stress on the vessel walls that comprise the blood-brain barrier, BBB. Uh, BBB opening is achieved without mechanical or thermal injury to the vessel or parenchyma. Uh, so, in, as you can see in this figure, when we uh, direct the acoustic waves on these bubbles, uh, we are in, firstly, we are injecting these bubbles to the patient's uh, blood circulation. And then we are uh, aiming uh, these bubbles with the focus ultrasound, and these bubbles start enlarging. And when they enlarge, the tight junctions of the blood-brain barrier, aquaporin four channels are opening, and uh, it allows uh, dissolution of the particles inside the blood circulation into the uh, interstitial tissue here. Uh, it, and there's another type of cavitation. It's called inertial cavitation. So here uh, on the uh, bottom right, you can see that uh, we are all, all again sonicating the bubbles here but bubbles expand during the low pressure phase of the wave and begin to contract during the high pressure phase, eventually resulting in collapse and producing immense local heating and shock waves. Uh, this, is damaging the, this is damaging and undesirable. Actually, if you are doing this technique inside a tumor, then it becomes desirable. So uh, these bubbles are damaging around themselves and they are damaging the uh, tumor, tumor cells. Another application is that uh, we, can use, we can use low intensity focus ultrasound for neuromodulation. So we can uh, directly neuromodulate the brain by using focus ultrasound. So another application is that we can uh, deliver a uh, drug by using the focus ultrasound. So if you, uh, focus the beam on this uh, nanodroplets, they are uh, releasing their content into the blood circulation, and then it dissolves into the desired in interstitial inter space. Uh, another application is that in instead of increasing the temperature to 56 degrees, we can increase the temperature around 43 degrees, and this causes uh, uh, this causes the position of the uh, lymphatic cells uh, into this area and they can fight with the tumor cells. So there are different systems that we use commercially. The most common one is the exablate neuro one. Uh, you see the prototype, you see the machine in the Dr. Yamamoto's presentation. So this is, uh, a transducer that's covering all the heads. There are also two other different commercial machines. One is called uh, Cartera Sonocloud and the other one is Navifast. So the, we use the Exablate Neuro for 
thermal ablation and blood brain barrier opening, BBB opening. So these are actually two separate machines. Uh, so if you if the machine is set to six six hundred fifty kilohertz, then we can use the machine as an ablation tool. If the machine sets to 220 kilohertz, then you can use it for BBB opening. So, but they are actually selling as different machines, but the concept is the same. So these two Navifast and the Carter Sonoclot can be used for the BBB opening and the other treatment. So for neuromodulation, uh, we are, this is the neuromodul this is the neurofast device that we use for neuromodulation in our clinic. Actually, this is Dr. Robert Chan's clinic. Uh, so uh, this is again a transducer and it focused the acoustic waves on the center. Uh, it has a, uh, we can set the distance from three centimeters to eight centimeters. So we can uh, reach the very deep inside the brain with this uh, transducer. So I will mention about the thermoablation. So, sorry. So this is the Exablate 4000 machine that we use during our uh, clinical practice. So you, you can see that a patient is lying on the MRI table. Actually, the table is not the routine MRI, standard MRI table. This is the focus ultrasound machine itself. So this is a regular uh, general electrics MRI. And as Dr. Yamamoto mentioned, we are putting a membrane and a frame. This is the CRW frame on the patient's head. And we are connecting the membrane uh, to the machine. And the patient stays in the machine for around four or five hours. And we are uh, ablating the uh, pathological circuits. Uh, so, so this is a very new technology, actually. It is uh, the clinical application is just 10 years old. So DBS is far older than this treatment and gamma knife and radio frequency ablations are uh, far more older than this focus ultrasound treatment. It has several advantages over the other uh, methods. So for example, FAS is uh, very cost effective compared to deep brain stimulation. Uh, in deep brain stimulation, we are implanted an IP implantable pulse generator and lead, and this costs around $20,000 in Canada. So uh, it is a really very expensive treatment and we need to change the battery in every two, three years if it is not recharge, rechargeable battery. Uh, so it, it is, an, the EBS is a very expensive treatment. So, and another uh, disadvantage of the DBS is that it is an minimally invasive technique. So we are uh, putting the patient inside to the OR table and we are opening a burr hole and we are uh, doing a brain surgery actually. Uh, so it has the risk of hemorrhage, uh, brain infarction and all other complications of a brain surgery. Uh, but it, it is not that much common with the DBS surgery, but it, there is still risk. In FAS, we don't have such a risk because uh, we are using the MRI room instead of the operating room. And uh, we, can, we can operate patients as old as hundreds of years old. So there's no age limit with the focus ultrasound. So in, in with DBS, uh, most of the uh, regulatory boards are not paying the, or, or the insurance companies are not paying the money for the elder patients over eight, 70s, 80s. It is uh, because a very expensive treatment. Its advantage is that it is adjustable and re reversible. In FAS, we are ablating the tissue. The tissue become necrotic and it is irreversible. Uh, it also has some advantages over the gamma knife treatment. In gamma knife treatment, we saw, see the effect delay in a delayed patient, but in FAS, uh, we see the treatment effect immediately. And there's a oh, need for radiation for the gamma knife. So, and focus ultrasound is uh, 
sound technology and there is no radiation risk in the uh, focus ultrasound. Uh, in the RF, we are creating a lesion again by uh, radio frequency waves, but uh, we don't control the lesions uh, spatial and temporal, temporal resolution with the RF. So uh, we are doing the lesion arbitrarily. So uh, it is difficult to con control the lesion with the radio frequency, but it is very feasible, can very easily do done with the focus ultrasound. So which indications uh, are we using the high intensity focus ultrasound? FDA approved two indications. One is the essential tremor and the other one is the Parkinson's disease. So uh, they approved the Parkinson's disease uh, tremor dominant patients uh, initially, uh, but this year they also approved it for the other Parkinson's disease symptoms. Uh, it's focus ultrasound also approved uh, for some other indications outside of the USA. These are the depression, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, trigeminal neuralgia, and neuropathic pain. So for essential tremor, we are targeting the ventral uh, intermediate uh, nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, there is two uh, pilot trials in this field. The one is from the Toronto and the other one is from the United States. Uh, this first uh, paper contains four patient, patients. Uh, this one uh, has 15 patients. So they showed the safety of the procedure uh, in this first pilot uh, trials. They are open label studies, which means that uh, neither the uh, patient nor the uh, clinical investigator are blinded. So there is no blinding in this treatment. They show the safety and then it followed with a randomized controlled trial uh, in 2016. They pub it published in New England Journal. Uh, it shows the treatment efficacy. Uh, the CREST score reduction at first year is 40% uh, for contralateral side and 35% for total CREST score. Uh, in this trial, they saw ad uh, adverse effects uh, in some patients. 14% 40, uh, of the patients have sensory disturbations. 2% have motor impairments, 9% of the patients have gait problems, and they haven't seen any speech problems in their cohort. So if we compare the outcomes uh, for the essential tremors, uh, if we compare the outcomes of the different treatment modalities for essential tremor, we can say that the effect is almost identical between them. Uh, the, Focus ultrasounds is associated with more paresthesia, which is uh, tingling and different sensations in the uh, on the limbs of, limbs of the patient. But other also complications are also uh, in a similar percentage within the modalities. Uh, but there is no direct study that is comparing the DBS with the focus ultrasound right now. Uh, so after the showing the safety of the unilateral procedure, uh, we uh, asked the question that if we can operate the patients bilaterally. So we uh, we were using ablation before with the radio frequency and gamma knife for the unilateral treatment. So some people can use the gamma knife for bilateral treatment too, but the effects are delayed in the gamma knife. So we want to uh, check if we can treat patients bilaterally. So we designed the open label study. Uh, it is a safety study. It is both phase one and phase two trial. So we treated the other hand of the patients to... Uh, so this is one of our patients. We first treated the uh, right hand of this patient six months ago. And this is six months after the surgery for the right hand. So you can see that there is no tremor in the right hand, very, very little tremor. It can be scored as one over four in the postural state. And you can see that the tremor in the left hand is four over four in the le left hand. 
So I will ask patient to touch his nose and then my finger. So you can see the action tremor. The treated hand is maybe two over four uh, in intensity. And look, look at the untreated hand. So this is left side is not treat, wasn't treated at that time. So it is four over four. Patient couldn't even touch the finger. So this is the day after the surgery. There's one day between these two videos and you can see the result here. So the patient's left hand is also uh, almost free of tremor. It is one over four uh, in severity in postural state. So in action, it is again two over four, right hand. It, it was treated six months ago. And look at the left hand. So he couldn't touch the finger before the treatment. Now he can touch the finger very easily. There is some still residual tremor, but uh, it is very acceptable for the patient. So these are the spirals that patients draw. This is actually another patient, not the same patient, but these are mostly identical for most of the patients in our cohort. So uh, this is before the first site of treatment. You can see that uh, nobody can draw a clear uh, spiral without uh, tremor both for both ends, for both right, right and left hand. So after the uh, first site treatment, you can see that the right hand uh, tremor is significantly improved. And on the other side, it is even worse. So after the two hours after the second site treatment, we exam examine the patient again, and you can see that patient can clearly draw spirals without uh, much tremor. So this effect continues after the treatment. At three months, it is like this. And at one year, it is also identical to the three months results. So we can use the, uh, we can treat Tar target different locations in essential tremor patients. So uh, this is a study from our lab again. So we identified the uh, sweet spot for the uh, telemotomy. So we identified where is the best spot to have the best clinical outcome. And we find that, that the region with, uh, associated with the best, best outcome is the uh, region between the ventrocaudalis nucleus and ventro intermediate, inter, ventral intermediate nucleus, and it is located uh, uh, in the ventral side of the uh, thalamus. So these people are targeted the uh, cerebrothalamic tract, uh, which is also called uh, dentatorubrothalamic tract. Uh, and uh, they published an open label study and their results are uh, actually good. So we can use the, uh, this treatment for non-essential tremor tremors also. Uh, there's a paper from Toronto again. Uh, this is uh, reporting six patients. Uh, most of them are dystonic, has dystonic tremor. And uh, it is also used for multiple sclerosis associated tremor. These are all case reports or open label studies. So future studies in this field uh, should focus on simultaneous bilateral telemotomy, uh, actually. So this is, we, we are preparing our ethical board approval and we, are, we will do a randomized controlled trial in this setting. So we did the uh, telemotomy in a stage patient. So this means that we treated one hand and after six months, we treated the second hand. Now we want to do treat the both hands at the same time, at the same procedure. So uh, we, we, we planned, uh, uh, we designed a, uh, a study and we approved for the uh, ethical board and we will hopefully start this trial soon. So another point is that we don't know the comparison between the DBS and focus ultrasound. So which one is superior to each other or are they equal? We don't know that actually. There is no direct study that comparing these two modalities. So this is another uh, feature study uh, topic. And we don't know the optimum patient selection criteria. 
and there's no guideline for focus ultrasound. These are all the works that can be done in the future in this field. So other than essential tremor, we are also uh, treating Parkinson's disease patients with focus ultrasound. So again, we, are, we can uh, target the ventral intermediate nucleus in this patient. Uh, there is a randomized control study, which was published in JAMA Neurology in 2017. After this study, uh, FDA approved the use of uh, VIM uh, telematomy, focus ultrasound telematomy, in a tremor dominant Parkinson's disease patient. So in this trial, uh, the cohort consists of 27 patients and CRISP score decreased by 62% in this uh, patient, patient. So as adverse effects, they saw paresthesia in seven patients and ataxia in one patient. So the, another target in the Parkinson's disease patients, which is the most common uh, target for DBS is the uh, subthalamic nucleus. Uh, the, this uh, randomized controlled trial in New England Journal recently published uh, last year, and uh, it consists of 40 patients, 13 of them are sham, sham uh, operated patients. Uh, UPDRS score decreased significantly in this trial, and after this trial, FDA approved the use of uh, focus ultrasound in all Parkinson's disease patients, not only tremor dominant Parkinson's disease patients. So they have also some adverse effects in this trial. They saw weakness in two patients, dysarthria in a patient, uh, gait problems in three patients, facial palsy in one patient. Uh, some of these adverse effects result at one year. Another uh, target is uh, globus pallidus interna. So there's only an open label study, uh, which, uh, which has uh, contains 20 patients. Uh, in this study, UPDR score decreased by 59%, and they haven't seen any severe adverse effects in this open label study. Uh, another target is the uh, bilateral uh, pallidotalamic tract track, uh, ablation, pallidotalamic tractotomy. So this is the, uh, they are targeting the pallidal efferent uh, at the level of the foros field H1, uh, ventral to the thalamus, and uh, they have a UPDRS score decrease of 52% at one year in their time patient cohort. So can we do bilateral uh, treatment in Parkinson's disease patients? So for all these targets, so there's no published data yet. There's a very big trial in Spain right now for the sub, uh, subthalamic nucleus. Uh, so far, we have treated three patients in Toronto Western Hospital uh, with bilateral VIM telematomy uh, in Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, we haven't published our data yet, so. And... Uh, yeah, this is this should be bilateral. Sorry, and uh, there is oh, sorry. Th then there is an, another uh, trial uh, which is underway uh, for the unilateral GPI uh, treatment. So we have only an open label study of for the GPI, and a randomized control trial is underway right now. So other than the movement disorders, we can use the focus ultrasound for the uh, other indications. Uh, one of them is neuropathic pain and trigeminal pain. So this one, the, the paper published in 2009 is the first transcranial focus ultrasound patient uh, treated with transcranial focus ultrasound. And uh, this, the group is from Switzerland. So they also uh, have a cohort uh, for trigeminal neuralgia. They did central lateral telematomy in this patient. Uh, they are all open label studies. They, they decreased the pain score in this patient by 71% at one year. This study consists of eight patients and this one is 11 patients. This is for chronic neuropathic pain other than trigeminal neuralgia. And they decreased the pain score by 57% at one year in this cohort. 
Uh, we can also use the uh, focus ultrasound for the treatment of uh, psychiatric diseases. Uh, depression and obsessive compulsive disorder uh, are among them. So uh, there are open label safety studies there are, which consist of uh, four to 12 patients. So they show successful results uh, and the Again, randomized control trials are on the way for this indication. Uh, this paper published this year uh, in uh, Movement Disorders Journal, it is for the dystonia. The target is the vent ventralis oralis anterior nucleus. So uh, they have one permanent dysarthry at one year, other than that they don't have any severe adverse effects. Uh, they, uh, the patient's uh, WCRS score decreased from 6.3 to 1.6 in this uh, pilot trial. So uh, among the approved indications, there are also experimental indications for focus ultrasound. Neuro-oncology is one of them. So we can uh, theoretically ablate the tumors uh, by using the focus ultrasound. This is uh, one application. Uh, another application is that we can open the blood-brain barrier and allow the uh, drugs, genes, uh, antibodies to uh, pass through the uh, interstitial space. And another uh, application is the liquid biopsy. So liquid biopsy, is the identifications of the uh, tumor's uh, genetic profile by using the peripheric blood of the patients. Uh, this can be this can be done by the uh, peripheral tumors uh, like uh, breast cancer or uh, liver cancer. But for brain tumors, it is uh, not very feasible because the bl blood brain barrier blocks the release of uh, circulating uh, tumor DNAs into the peripheral circulation. So we can open the blood brain barrier with using the focus ultrasound and we can increase the circulating free uh, tumor DNA in, in the uh, peripheral circulation of the patient. Another application can be the immunomodulation and radio sensitization. So focus ultrasound uh, is increasing the efficacy of the radiotherapy. And it also uh, allows uh, lymphatic cells to come into the region and uh, starts an inflammation there uh, to fight with the tumor cells. So there is an uh, example of uh, focus ultrasound ablation in neuro-oncology patients. So in this paper, they are treating a hypothalamic hematoma with focus ultrasound. Uh, the patient significantly decreased uh, his seizure frequency in this paper. And this is, I think, the only paper about the hypothalamic hematoma. So the ablation of tumors has started before the transcranial application of focus ultrasound. So in this uh, open label study, uh, they are treating three patients with craniotomy. So they are opening a, a hole in over, over the bo skull bone in the operating room, and they are treating this patient uh, using the focus ultrasound. They ablated the tumors of the three patients successfully in 2006 in Israel. And then uh, it allows for a bigger trial in Harvard uh, using the focus ultrasound for ablating, for the aim of ablating the tumors. Uh, in this uh, trial, they first used a, a primordial version of the transducer, so they couldn't make the temperature to elevate to adequate levels for tissue ablation. Uh, they published these results uh, in neurosurgery for three patients. Uh, the, actually, it is a failure paper, so they failed to elevate the temperature. Then uh, they uh, upgrade the uh, transducer uh, and then they started to they started to elevate the temperature to adequate levels in this cohort 
this is the uh, Kularvo Hünenen. He is a scientist in uh, Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. Uh, he is the guy who is behind all this uh, technology, focus ultrasound section technology. Actually, this is Peter Black from Harvard University, and this is uh, Ferenc Jolet. Uh, they are neurosurgeons from the Harvard University. So they started uh, treating uh, brain tumor patients in the second phase of the trial. But in their second patient, uh, they have a very severe complication and the patient died intraoperatively. So they, the trial was ended immediately and there was no other trial so far about the uh, ablation of the tumors. There is only one case report from Switzerland. Uh, in this patient, you can see a thalamic uh, high-grade uh, tumor here. They ablate this tumor. Uh, this is the uh, top, top pictures are uh, preoperative pictures, and the bottom are um, postoperative uh, images. You can see that there is uh, the tumor clearly ablated here, uh, but it is just one patient and ablation lasted five hours in this patient. So uh, the, our current commercial machines are designed to ablate even sub-millimeter uh, areas. So ablate, trying to ablate really very large areas is very difficult with the current commercial machine. So maybe in the future, they can design a new machine for uh, ablating larger areas. But with the current technology, it is difficult to ablate and last really very long for uh, patients. So uh, we use, as I said, uh, we are using the uh, focus ultrasound to enhance the liquid biopsy procedures. So uh, there is some uh, animal studies which, uh, which are using focus ultrasound to ablate the tumor and increasing the liquid biopsy uh, results. Uh, this is one of the animal studies. There are also several, several more animal studies in this field. So we try to uh, translate this knowledge into the uh, real humans, and uh, we started a clinical trial. Uh, this is called Brain Tumor Focus Ultrasound Enabled Liquid Biopsy Trial. Uh, we treated our first patients, actually. Uh, it was a sublineal uh, GBM patient. So we uh, sonicate, not actually, we ablated a, a one centimeter region uh, inside the tumor in this patient, and we draw, drew blood before and after the surgery. Uh, this is the first patient of the trial. The results are not yet published. So uh, we will publish the first result after treating a few more patients. Uh, instead of ablating the tumor, we can directly open the blood-brain barrier to enhance the liquid biopsy. This has been already done by the Sunnybrook group. Uh, as you can see in these uh, figures, uh, they are opening the blood-brain barrier inside the tumor, and they, are check, they check the uh, circulating free DNA uh, before and after the BBB opening, and they found that, that the circulating free DNA is increasing significantly after sonication. This published this year in Neuro-Oncology. So other than thermoablation, uh, we are using blood barrier opening for uh, different indications. So we can open the blood brain barrier for, for example, the drug delivery. So the first safety and feasibility study is, has been done in Alzheimer patients. ALS patients, amniotropic lateral sclerosis patients, and Parkinson's disease uh, dementia patients. So they successfully can uh, open the blood brain barrier in this patient cohorts. So BBB opening allows passage of 2000 kilo Dalton molecules. Uh, while BBB is intact, uh, if you give uh, patients molecules uh, of 150 kilo Dalton, uh, peak, less than 1% of them can pass through the blood-brain barrier. So it is significantly increasing the size of the molecules that can pass through the, uh, through the interstitial space. 
and it has been shown in Alzheimer patients. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, and, but uh, we are approaching the uh, okay. Okay. okay, okay. So another application is that uh, we can use it in the chemotherapy applications, antibody, antibody delivery, and immunostimulation. And we can also use it for the visualizing the glymphatic system. So as you can see here, uh, in normal brain, uh, if the BBB is intact, uh, the uh, contrast medium is coming through the artery and passing to the capillaries and passing through the vein and it uh, enters the dural sinus or meningeal lymphatics. But uh, they, they open the uh, blood brain barrier with pus, and they are suggesting that the, uh, the uh, contrast agents pass through the interstitial space, and there is a mechanism that clears this uh, uh, contrast uh, mediums by uh, sending them through the perivenular space and then through the sinus. They say that this is the this can be the glymphatic system in humans. We also use the phosphor drug gene and real cost drug uh, adrenal associated virus serotype 9 uh, delivery and cell delivery. And we can use it for the neuromodulation, as I said. Uh, uh, this is the first paper published in Nature Neuroscience. Uh, they modulate the activity of primary somatosensory cortex in humans in this paper and this is a paper from our lab uh, we systematically evaluate the stimulation parameters and understand its effects on the motor cortex excitability and behavior so take-home messages is that SAS can be used for incisionless treatment of brain disorders it is not true to say uh, non-invasive because the uh, it, the ultrasound waves are invasive actually so it is uh, better to say incisionless. Essential tremor and Parkinson's disease are the two FDA-approved indications of pus ablation. BBB opening can be used for drug delivery and enhancement of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and liquid biopsy applications. Pus neuromodulation may be possible in the future. So and an important thing is that open-label phase one studies. Open-label means that no, no one is blinded in the patient uh, in the in the trial. Uh, are useful to test the safety and feasibility of novel approaches and calculate sample size for larger randomized controlled trials. But you need level one evidence provided by randomized controlled trials for a regulatory board approval of a treatment modality. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Sergio for his speech. Uh, now we are going to continue the question and answer to that. Uh, due to the uh, insufficient of time, uh, I will be able to uh, ask only one question. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you use the ultrasound uh, sonication to deliver drugs? And what example can be shown here? Uh, what are the, some limitations of the use technique so far? So uh, there are none of the problems. When you, you sonicate them with focused ultrasound, they are changing their shapes and releasing their contents. So if you uh, inject, for example, a drug inside this nanodroplets, and if you uh, inject this nanodroplets into the patient's blood circulation, uh, you can ultrasound a specific region that you want to deliver the drug uh, with focused ultrasound. And uh, the focused ultrasound is going to change the shape of this nanodroplets and the drug inside the nanodroplets will be released into the uh, ex, uh, expected area. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so may, maybe I can show it here. So, so, so if you, yeah, if you have a look at this figure, so. We are sonicating these bubbles, and then the, after sonication, uh, there's uncaging of the uh, nanodroplets and the drug delivered to the interstitial space. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
We thank Mr. Sarja for all his contributions and we would like to give this certificate uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it, is, it, is, it was a great pleasure for me to uh, present our work here. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for us too, sir. Uh, and uh, after our break, uh, our symposium will continue with the presentation of Dr. Hassan Ayaz. Uh, stay with neuroscience.